understanding, now you can start breaking things down. But no, 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 no. I know it's a good idea, it's too late. Thank you so much for attending the 20th anniversary of the Faraday Shows. We're glad you got a seat in the auditorium here. Uh, you're the lucky ones, I guess. Um, my name is Dave Maiulo. I build and design and basically create the physics demonstrations that we use in the classes. But what we've done with those, we've realized that the students love the demonstrations and love seeing them explain some of those physics principles. So what we've done is we've taken a bunch of them together and we've Developed this show about 20 years ago. We do a whole lot of outreach in bringing this ideas to other places too, okay? Showing people physics using these demonstrations. And it seems to work, as we can tell from this crowd right here, okay? So, uh, before we do get started, did anybody enjoy some of the demonstrations we had out here with those students? Yeah. Aren't they wonderful? Come on in, everybody. Come on in, everybody. Take room for everybody. Working with these wonderful young people gives me a lot of hope for the future. I hire about 30 to 35 students every year to help me do exactly what you saw them do out there. And they're a big part of what we're going to do in here today, too. Okay? So if you're young and you know you're going to be going to Rutgers and you're any major at all, anthropology, sociology, science, engineering, medicine, I don't care. Come and see me if you want to help us out and do these shows, because it is a lot of fun, OK? Thank you, crew, OK? I really appreciate it. Well done, everybody. <laughs> Mark Croft. Hi. Welcome to the 20th Annual Lecture, Faraday Lecture. And uh, I want to express my thanks to Dave, who really makes it possible. He, he makes the machinery run just perfectly, and has allowed me to keep on going, and I owe him a great deal. Uh, when we do these demonstrations, we typically do the demonstrations that we do in the first year of a physics course, and we find sometimes that the students enjoy them a little more if the professor is embarrassed, yeah, it's just a token coat to prove I own one. Uh, uh, if the uh, professor is embarrassed or injured or hopefully hospitalized, uh, that won't happen uh, unless I drop on the spot. Uh, okay, so uh, I... The one thing I would like to start off with is that uh, the uh, five fundamental solids, the regular solids of, uh, of Plato, uh, the icosahedron, which you can make with uh, mag formers, and then the tetrahedron, the cube, and the octahedron, and then you can also make the uh, dodecahedron. I highly, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> well, the top wasn't on quite tight enough. Okay, now we'll get into the physics. The physics here to begin with is the Newton's first law, which is the law of inertia. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. Usually an object at rest is me around the house. The outside force is usually my wife. <laughs> <laughs> These are, of course, uh, my wife's best china, an accumulation of them. And... Uh, when I pull it slowly, nothing happens. If I pull it very rapidly, hopefully nothing will happen again, and I won't get a face full of dishes. I'm fairly confident this will work. Yeah. <laughs> Warning, don't try that at home. <laughs> OK. The next of Newton's laws is the force. Oh, OK, there is still this one. Uh, object in motion, objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. And uh, poor old Aristotle believed that in order to keep something moving, you had to keep pushing it, much like me. <laughs> uh, you have to keep pushing it. Well, no, if you take the, air, the friction away, it will go in a straight line with a constant speed. OK, that's enough. Uh, so that's an object. That's also the uh, law of inertia. 
And the next one is the F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. In other words, if you have a little mass and exert a force on it, you'll get a lot of acceleration, that is a change in the speed, and it goes flying off there. And then a little larger mass, and you hit it with the same force, it doesn't do that much. You see, you have a bad seat there. Did I, I forgot to tell you guys not to sit in the front row. <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> okay, and now this is a lead brick, and it doesn't go anywhere. It has so much mass, it has so much inertia, it doesn't like to move. I can even beat on my hand, and it doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> okay, that's the law of inertia. Uh, before we get to any more of Newton's laws, I want to review something that Newton knew. Uh, he developed the theory of gravity also, and uh, that is the fact that objects that aren't touching each other can exert forces on each other. All right, he knew about magnets. Uh, this is called action at a distance, if you want to sound sophisticated about it. And these are called buzz magnets, because you can do this sort of a trick with them. I recommend them. They're very stable materials. There are other magnets that are quite dangerous. And the, on a, by, a, by the by, I have here a bunch of nickels. Now I want you to notice that all the Canadian nickels that are before a certain date get picked up. That's because they're pure nickel. The American nickels don't get picked up because they're 20% copper, which is non-magnetic. Nickel's a magnetic material. Okay, you can try that. Oh, you're going to do this one now? Yeah, yep. I'm going to do this one now. So we heard that force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? We heard that one. Physics equation, it's got to be real scary. No. We're breaking it down for you right here. What's this in my hand right here? Bowling ball. Are bowling balls big and massive? Yeah, they're big and heavy, right? They got a lot of mass. And I put that bowling ball right here. Uh, what's that bowling ball attached to? Is it a big heavy rope? No, it's just a light little string. And if there's anything you get out of our show at all, it's that human beings really are scientists all the time. We really are. We're always doing experiments in our head, looking at things, trying to measure what's going to happen. So as scientists, can you tell me, can I pick up that heavy bowling ball with that light little string? Yes. Yeah. Do you hear different answers? Of course you do, and that's exactly what they do in that big building next door. They argue about a whole lot of things. But as scientists, what do we got to do to actually find out what's going to happen? Do it. Do it. That's how we really learn in life. You try the experiment. So let's see what happens when I pull slowly, and I can actually lift that bowling ball right off that table, just like so. Now, I got that bowling ball suspended right here like that. And we know that force is equal to mass, time, mass times acceleration. Am I accelerating this bowling ball a lot? No. no. Can I? Hey, after the show, you go, hey, Siri, what's a jerk? Because a jerk is actually a physics term. It actually means a change in acceleration. Look it up. It's right there in Wikipedia. At the same time, if I'm the jerk and I pull that hard on the string, what happens to the string? It breaks. A little more acceleration, remember, a little more acceleration, a little more force, it breaks that string just like that. But let me ask you, when do you do that experiment? Who said never? Because I hope you do it a couple times a day. What's this right here? Toilet paper, and hey, it's the same experiment. You pull slowly for some squares. You get enough squares, what do you do? You jerk it. It's the same experiment. Do I got to explain this one? <laughs> I'm really worried about the audience. Here we go. That's for you. OK, now we get to the sort of the sleeper of Newton's three laws. Uh, Ready? In this one, you divide the universe into two parts, A and B. And you have a force reaction force. The force of A on B is equal and opposite, and just equal to the force of B on A. They make these things stronger every year. <laughs> That's good enough. Uh, OK, now this is a two-part system, the air in the balloon and the elastic balloon. And if I let go of here, what's going to happen? Yeah, the air's going to get shoved in one direction, and the air balloon goes in the other direction. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't name it. 
Now, typically, they didn't like it when you did it with a balloon, so he'd like the professor to take the place of the balloon. Dave will take this one. Yeah, I'm going to take the place right now. Hey, oh, so we heard that every force, every action is an equal and opposite reaction. I take my two hands. I press them together really hard. There's no movement there. There's a whole lot of force, but there's no movement, right? And what I have right here, I got this pretty red cart. I can put the cart layer like this, and I can push on the surface of the cart really hard. But it just pushes equally back on me, holding me up. There was no movement there either. But what we have inside this cart is a big, big, heavy, massive fire extinguisher filled with lots of force, lots of CO2. And I'm going to take all the force in that fire extinguisher, and I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to hit that sail right there with all that force. So ask scientists, can you tell me what direction is this cart then going to go in? Just been, okay, look, there's no grading here today. It's not even pass fail, all right? You can be as brave as you want. Who says I go that way? Be brave. Who says I go that way? Excellent, okay, good. Who says I'm headed this way? <laughs> Who knows I'm going this way? <laughs> Sooner or later, I hope not today. Uh, by the way, two things about this. One, it's an extremely loud noise. So for you people here in front, be ready for a loud noise. And it's just like a grenade, you actually pull the pin. <laughs> so let's have a little countdown. It is a rocket. Three, two, one. <laughs> Which direction did I go? <laughs> Nowhere. The only thing that happens is your butt gets really cold. That's it. <laughs> it's right down your pants. So why? You saw and heard how much force is on, this, on the sail from the fire extinguisher, but there's no movement. Well, remember, you don't push on yourself and go into any kind of motion. If you're on a skateboard, how do you get the skateboard to move? You push on the ground, right? Push on someone standing next to you. Do rockets have sails? No. So what do we do to this rocket cart to make it a rocket cart? Take the sail <laughs> off, OK? And uh, this is why we have Matt. Well, we have Matt for a lot of reasons, but <laughs> this is one of the best ones. So now I'm going to be over here. Which way is this cart now moving? This way. It's obvious which way rockets are going to go, right? You see your rocket? Yeah, it's headed that direction. But let me ask, does Matt have to be behind me with that sail for me to go forward? No, there's nobody in outer space standing behind rockets. But it's the job we gave Matt, OK? You ready, Matt? All right. Let's see the rocket cart in action. Three, two, one. Woo! <laughs> well done. Okay, now it so happens, doing, oh, you're going to do that? Or I, should, oh, I can no, do no, this. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, it so happens I originally uh, developed a slightly different version of this so that the students would enjoy it more. And that version is shown right up here. And I'll show you what happens. I used to just fire it in between my legs and blow myself like a, like a human <laughs> rocket. That was before I had uh, five knee, knee operations, an artificial knee, and it takes me a while to get my courage up. It's not the speed that kills. It's not the speed that kills you, it's acceleration. Now it's, I, the first time I ever did that demonstration, uh, I was in a rug floor, I had a little fire extinguisher and an old pair of skates, and nothing happened. And I got so angry, I came back the next time with a 50-pound fire extinguisher, <laughs> a new pair of racing skates, and you know how you plot common sense versus time and it usually goes up? <laughs> well, mine turned around and went to dead zero because I wanted to get off the rug floor and so I got up on a table. And when I was up on that table, I didn't hold it as carefully as that way I was holding it there. I held it a little bit off to the side. I discovered another piece of physics that I should have known, that if you hold it off to the side, it sets you into rotation also. <laughs> so I blew myself rotating and translating off the table. <laughs> I don't do that one anymore. <laughs> OK, Dave, go ahead. The good old days, right? Hey, you have <laughs> yeah, a cool fish, days. and you say, hey, fish, how's the water? The fish like looks at you and says, what are you talking about? Because the fish is always in what? The water. So they don't really understand the question of being out of the water, right? And I ask you, how much force of the atmosphere is pressing down on your body all the time? Anybody know? 
You may know the equations, you may know the numbers, but you don't really realize how much force is on you all the time from our atmosphere. And it's a lot of force. So to show you how much force is on you from the atmosphere, we're going to take all the atmosphere out. Not from the room, from this <laughs> long tube right here. I'm going to turn this vacuum pump on. It's going to pull all the air out of this really long tube. Now, on one side of this really long tube, I have a ping pong ball. On the other side of this really long tube, I have three, count them three, empty soda cans. What I'm going to do now, you can hear the air leaving this tube. I'm going to go ahead and puncture the side of this tube. Since all the air is out of the tube, the air all around us, the same air that's pressing on you, is going to rush back into this tube. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The mass of this ping pong ball is going to be accelerated down the tube. And it's going to come out on this side next to those soda cans going 700 miles an hour. Yeah, that's how much force is on you. You don't realize it because you're always in it. Two things about this. One, I dare you to actually see that ping pong ball move through the tube. You really can't. I've tried with uh, slow motion cameras. You really can't see it. Also, this is an extremely loud noise. So if you're scared of loud noises, please cover your ears. All right, you ready? Three, two, one. And what have we done? What have we done? Soda can number one. Shot through by a ping pong ball. Exactly. Soda can number two just bent, and it didn't get to number three this time. And that will happen. You never know. There's a little vagaries in all kinds of experiments. And the gentleman who actually built this for us is right here, right now. A big round of applause. Yes, for our machine shop. All right, this for your daughter. There you go. Thank you. OK, so far we've been talking about things that went in straight lines. And now we're going to exert a force on something constantly so it doesn't go in a straight line but goes in a circle. And this uh, cushion on the end of a string is a nice way of doing it. I really like a string because I know a string I can pull straight towards my hand. It's not much good this way. It's not much good this way. I can't push down with it. All I can do is pull towards my hand. I can wiggle my hand a little bit to make up for friction that will lose energy, but we'll ignore that. So now I'm going to swing it in a circle. And so because you know I basically am just pulling towards the center, in order to keep Ready? it going in the circle, I'm constantly pulling we towards the center. It. It's a center-seeking force that makes it go in a circle. And then I'll do the David and Goliath thing, and it should go in a straight line. <laughs> yeah, straight <laughs> line when I let go of it. OK. Here's another example of force and mass and acceleration. <laughs> Just like that. Because what we need to do is fill this glass right now with some champagne. That's the best Alaskan champagne. It really is. Actually, in no a little while, that may future. not be a joke. That's right. So we got lots of champagne in there, more than Mark actually likes to have in there. Yes. And now what I have is a very flat tray. Because I'm going to put this glass of champagne in the middle of the flat tray and now give this to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you put it in the middle, right? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> OK. You know why they like me to do this demo. Because I'm not very good. There's a good <laughs> chance I and the whole front row is going to get wet. <laughs> OK, let's see. If I can swing this in a circle and pull towards the center so it always gets pulling towards the center and doesn't fall off, there's only one problem. I don't know how to stop. Whoa! Yeah! <laughs> ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, almost, Mark. Almost. I'll take it. Oh, do we have some towels? Or... <laughs> Sorry about that. It happens. When I used to do the fire extinguisher between my legs, I really needed that drink. <laughs> Gonna need more. Okay, we're now up to energy, right? Yep, you got that tennis ball. Okay. Yes, this is the kind of tennis ball I can still see at my age. <laughs> It is a tennis ball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK. So uh, if I was to throw this at you guys hard, then you would be worried about getting hit because it would have energy of motion 
that would get in converted into energy of broken noses or broken glasses or something like that. Energy of destruction. But there's another way I can give this thing a certain velocity in a very casual way. I just hold it up here at a very high height. And I just let go of it. And it hits the floor with a good amount of velocity. So it has energy of motion when it hits the floor. And now we use conservation of energy. When it was up here, it must have still had that energy, but it was tied up in energy of position. It's like you see a safe hanging over the sidewalk. You don't walk underneath the safe, right? You know it can fall. Well, energy of position is extremely important. And then when it bounces off, it turns it back and forth between energy of position and energy of motion. Well, the students usually don't relate to that so well. So I have to take the place of something that it's going to run into. But first, we have to set it up a little bit. Oh, yes, I was I don't know where put on my helmet. There's we my helmet. Okay. <clears throat> I used to dream about go heading up here, falling off, letting go of that, and having it hit me when I got up on the way back. <laughs> OK. This is my old college football helmet, which you'll notice is cracked, <laughs> which could explain a great deal of my behavior since then. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm going to start with this up here, and down there we have a cinder block. Energy of position goes into energy of motion at the bottom, and then it goes to energy of destruction. Okay, now what I have to do is take the place of the cinder block. Except I don't do it down there, I do it up here. And technically, I shouldn't have to worry at all. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> I shouldn't have to worry at all, because if it ever gets back to my nose again, it should have only energy of position. And I don't have to worry about breaking my nose. I do not. I do not. I die. No! <laughs> okay. The students are always rooting for the, the ball, the wrecking ball. <laughs> We haven't lost a professor yet on that one. <laughs> yet. <laughs> Conservation of energy is something you depend on. That's for you. OK. I'll set you up here, too. Oh, you got my uh, switching over to yeah. the, uh, uh, yeah. OK, we saw that that pendulum, that weight on a string, swung, swung all the way over to the other side of the room and stopped and came back. So you're constantly converting energy of position to energy of motion with a pendulum. Uh, and that you can see right here. There's the green and the blue pendulums. And you'll notice that the little red pendulum is running back and forth fast, converting energy of position to energy of motion very quickly. Uh, the big one here is doing it very slowly. This is something Galileo re realized while he woke up in church watching the chandeliers swing. Uh, you can also do it with a spring. If you have a heavy weight, you're converting energy of motion to energy of position. Energy of position would be stretch spring. You know, you can do exercises. You can also pick the hairs off your chest at the same time. <laughs> and this one's moving really fast. So systems tend to like to swap energy back and forth between position and motion at their own characteristic time scale. And it doesn't matter how you set them off, they always do what they like the best. Dum, dum. It always changes the energy back and forth at a characteristic time. Now, and you don't, it's independent of the way you start it. Well, there's another thing you can do, and you can wiggle this. If I wiggle it very slowly, you notice it doesn't stretch. And so you've not you're not really putting any energy into the spring. If I wiggle it very quickly, it basically still doesn't do anything. But if I wiggle it at just the frequency it likes to be at the time interval, it likes to get the energy on each part of the cycle, the same part of the cycle each time, it builds up. I pull only when it wants me to pull. And it gets out of hand fairly quickly. Dave will show you a place where it gets yeah, out of hand exactly later. Exactly that. So, um, hey, you know, it's the holiday season, right? And kids, 
your parents may bring you to a very good restaurant to celebrate those holidays, right? And when you sit down, these glasses will be on the table in front of you. But you, you know, the waiter knows you're too young to have any wine, so sooner or later the waiter's gonna come by and take these glasses from the table. Just gonna grab them off the table in front of you. Don't let this happen, <laughs> all right? Dave Instead, take your hand, put it at the bottom of the glass like this, hold it nice and tight. Take your other fingers, put it right in your dad's water glass like that, all right? <laughs> and go ahead and just rub the top of the glass. Because when you do that, you have a nice pretty tone coming from that glass, right? But the best part of this experiment is what? You're going to be bugging your parents, <laughs> right? They're going to be like, knock it off. You're bothering everybody in the restaurant. What do you say? Hey, I'm doing physics. This is going to go on all <laughs> night long. And who else is going to hear the sound is the waiter, right? The waiter comes rushing in. Oh, what, what are you doing? Like, this is a quiet restaurant. You can't do that. And you say, waiter, I have a question. If I take the rest of my dad's water and I go ahead and fill that wine glass, are we going to have a higher tone or a lower tone? Be brave. What are we going to have? You sound just like the waiter because it's actually now a lower tone. You have a lower tone because you have the density of the water now dancing with that density of the wine glass. That combination gives you a lower resonant frequency. But have fun at your next restaurant, all right? <laughs> Parents, have fun at your next restaurant. <laughs> OK, we're going to do the same thing now, except we're going to tickle just a plain old rod, an aluminum rod. And you wouldn't think of it, I can probably make you want to cover your ears <laughs> without hitting you with this rod. And so let's see, and Dave, oh, you've got mm -hmm. the cup, OK? It has a natural frequency it likes to ring at. That's why loudspeakers are sh shaped like this, an efficient way of adding that sound energy to the air. OK, now, of course, I'm holding it here so it can't vibrate here. So if I tweak it here and grab it on the end where it has to vibrate, you can see from the top picture of how it's vibrating, at the it's end it has to be free to vibrate. Well, suppose I move my hand and a little, this is a little bit like playing a musical instrument and putting your fingers someplace on the strings, I'll move a little bit here, and so this will be a zero, and this will be what we call a half a wavelength. Actually, it's a quarter wavelength, but that's all right. And I will now tickle it, and it should be a higher frequency, shorter wavelength. Okay. I held it here where it had to not vibrate at all at a similar symmetrical location on the other end. It was not vibrating, but when I grabbed it in the middle where it had to vibrate a lot, I killed it. Okay, so we really understand well what's going on with this, experimentally anyway. Now what else can we shake with sound? Well, what I have inside this box that's right here in front of you is a beaker. You know, in biology and chemistry, they use beakers for lots of reasons. But for physics, we use beakers for a whole nother reason. We don't pour any chemicals. We like to break them. <laughs> what I can do is I can actually vibrate that beaker with some sound. Now, you can't see it actually do anything. You might hear a little bit, but you really can't see it. You just say to me, hey, Dave, I don't see anything. I really don't have to believe you. And you're right, you don't. You need evidence for things. You really want to see some proof. So to just show you that, I'm going to turn off that light and turn on that light. And now I'm also going to turn off all the lights in our room. Because when I do that, and actually go ahead and blank this, what? Let's go ahead and do that. And now what I'm going to do is turn it up again. And you can see the walls of that beaker vibrate, shaking quite violently with that sound energy. But what happens if I give it too much sound energy? It's going to break. Do you want to see that? Yeah. Of course you do. Three, two, one. Like, just like that, breaks every time. <laughs> Are you going to do the fogger or should I start in the standing waves? Which one do you want me to do? You want to do the oh, yeah, let me do that. Okay. Now we just uh, we showed you some wave motion, but now we're going to talk about another kind of wave. What's this in my hand? It's a garbage can. You ever pick up a garbage can? Yeah, when I was a kid, I had to take in the garbage cans all the time, right? And uh, what's it got on one side? 
A hole. And what's it got on the other side? Big slab of rubber. It's kind of like a big drum. And what I can do with this garbage can, and I can do that. And some of you down here might actually feel something, right? I can do that. And you might feel something. One for you. One over there. Now you there and back, did you feel anything? That they turned around and said, hey, I felt something. And I'm not telling any of you liars. You're not liars. <laughs> Would you necessarily have to believe them? No, that's not what science is all about. Uh, candle? So, in a lot of science, especially in astronomy, we actually do a lot of research and we learn a lot by the effect one thing has on another from a distance. We don't actually see what's going on, but we see that effect and we can you know, decide on a lot of things. So Matt here's got a candle, and I can take this device and blow that out. So you now all know that something's going on. But you still didn't see exactly what's going on. And remember, physics likes to show you exactly what's going on. So what I'm doing is I'm filling this garbage can with some theatrical fog. Now, theatrical fog is just glycerin we heat up, and they put glycerin in all your food. They just don't tell you, so don't worry about this. <laughs> but what I'm going to do now, what's happening every single time I hit the end of the garbage can, you just didn't see it. And this, to me, is one of the fun examples of why science is so much fun. What exactly? is that. What is that? Yeah. And that was happening every single time I hit this. Every time. I dare you to go home and build one. Why not, right? You know what's really fun too is you can even aim it now. Just like that. Now, what's that shape? That's a circle, that's right. Hey, what's that shape? Square. So if I take a square and I put it on the end of this garbage can, what are we going to see now? Squircles. <laughs> Hearts. How about a rhombus? Square? Are you curious? Human beings should be curious. So let's put a little more fog in here. I put some more in. What are we going to see? Circles. Only stable shape is the smoke ring. Smoke squares are like unicorns. You want them to be real, but they don't exist. All right? Sometimes in life, things really don't exist. It's, that's the truth. Now, why is the square not stable? Well. That circle is back spinning. The square doesn't allow that back spin. It kind of breaks up before it can do anything. It becomes that circle. That's the only way it can actually exist. In fact, in nature, volcanoes shoot smoke rings all the time, and they are not perfect circles. Now, one more thing about this that I think is really quite neat. Anybody here know the term LIGOS or gravitation waves? Anybody? Two black holes combined in our universe. And what they did is they kind of did a little dip into space time. They kind of shook things up a little bit with those, all that mass. So I want to show you exactly what a gravitational wave looks like. Because what do I have right here? An ellipse. Yeah, that's an ellipse. And I'm going to put that ellipse right here on the end of the garbage can. And now I'm going to go ahead and put a little more fog in here. Because when I do that, we're going to see exactly what a gravitational wave looks like. Because this is exactly what it looks like. Watch. You see it oscillating back and forth? Goes from one, so one side to the other. That's what they look like as they move through space. Just like that. That bending in space time. But go home and build one, all right? I dare you. There you go. Thank you. This is actually a simulation of a gravity wave, and you can see the elliptical endpoint. It's going back with the long axis going in and out. And that's what happens with a gravity wave detector. It has two very long arms, one of which shrinks and the other of which extends. And they go like this. And they pick up that very small change to pick up gravity waves. OK. Now, Dave was showing you there a disturbance that propagated through the air. But whenever you have any kind of a medium, say a way, a string, and you wiggle an end of the string, you create a disturbance that propagates at the speed of this down the string. I've got 
dampening on here, so I lose it a little bit due to friction, but you can see it goes down, it reflects back, and it comes back, okay? Well, there's a special sort of wave. If you go to the ocean, you remember looking at the ocean waves, they go up and they go down, right? They in nice, smooth fashion. That's called a simple harmonic wave, and that's a really neat kind of wave to have, and there's Two things you should notice about a wave like this, and I have two examples of vibrating ropes right here. And the wave goes out the door. You can think of it uh, like a wave in the ocean. If you vibrate this very slowly, the distance, the repeat distance in the wave is very long. They call that a wavelength. If you vibrate this very quickly, the distance between the peaks is very short, short wavelength. And if it's sound waves, this one would be a very low frequency. Low frequency. This one would be a very high frequency. High frequency! <laughs> you like my perfect pitch, right? Uh, it so happens if you generate a wave like this, instead of just letting it go out the window, you reflect it back. When it's coming back, it interferes with the wave that's going this way and you create a thing we call a standing wave. Here's the first standing wave for, on a string. They call that the jump rope mode. Zero on the end because you can't vibrate the wall or the, the mounting there. A maximum in the middle. Now we go to the next higher frequency. You can think about playing a guitar. And there's no amplitude here, but there's two maximums there. It picks out just the frequency it likes. Now we go to another higher frequency. Well, I mean, how, do we, how many do we have now? Oh, there yeah. we go. Now we have three maximums and two nodes. And want to go one more? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Those are the possible standing <laughs> waves that you can have on the rope. <laughs> Remember the aluminum rod? That had the same shapes, okay? It was standing waves on a piece of aluminum, sound waves on a piece of aluminum. And only certain ones worked. Now what travels in waves? He was talking about its sound. So there's a sound. And I tell, this is an odd question. Can you tell me how big that sound is? The how big is that sound? Why is that an odd question? How do human beings measure sound? With our ears, right? We know how loud it is or how soft it is. We don't know how large it is. We don't see it with our eyes. But here in our show, we would like to show you just how big this sound is. Because what I have inside this tube is some propane. And I can light it. All right. It actually has as many candles as Mark's uh, birthday cake, but that's another story. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to turn it way down to here. When I turn it way down to here, and now, if you want to blank that out, that's good too. And now turn this up again. We see exactly how big that sound is. Because there is the wave. That's your sound wave. That's what you're hearing right now. You can now see the size of that wave while you hear it. Isn't that pretty? Yeah, you're seeing and hearing something at the exact same time now. That's what we like to do is show you this. Now, that's just one tone. I can actually change the tone. And when I do that, you can see it's a smaller wave. You go higher frequency, it's a smaller wave. And I can go lower, and now it's a bigger wave. So you can really see that relationship. But this is just one tone, right? One sound. What if I put a song in here instead? What might we see? We're going to see lots of dancing waves, right? In the song, all the waves in that song. Hey, I bet you all have a favorite song. And guess what? I'm not going to play any one of them. <laughs> no. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a song I think you all really know. And you say to me, Dave, there's no way you know a song that we actually all really know. And it's not even happy birthday. <laughs> I'm gonna turn that up a little bit. Now turn on that song. You tell me if you know this song. What song is that? 
Yeah, who doesn't know Star Wars? And now you can see all the waves in a song, all those standing waves. Hey, this is how I play my stereo at home. This is fun stuff, right? <laughs> so now you're seeing all those waveforms in one song. I hope you enjoy that. It's one of my favorite experiments of all time. You have to promise not to tell uh, Dave's uh, fire insurance people on that. <laughs> Okay, there's another sort of wave that you can have, and that's a light wave. Light travels, it's an oscillating electric and magnetic field, and it has different wavelengths and different energies. For instance, a red wave has a shorter wavelength than a green wave, and still sh shorter is a violet wave. And here I have a block of plastic. And when the light goes into the plastic, can you see how it changes directions? I shine it in an angle at the top, and then it takes a nosedive and goes downward. That's because the speed of light in air is the normal speed of light in vacuum, but it slows down when it goes into the block. And I can even reflect it off the far surface over here and have another reflection on the inside. Now there's, and you'll see there's also a reflection off the top surface. You always get a reflection when your speed changes the speed, slows down and goes into another medium. And you need to see it a little better over there? Okay, how's that? Oh, the ceiling is the reflection. Okay, now, there's one other way I want to show you to do this. There's a nice strong reflection, but here, notice right here, it reflects off the top surface and nothing comes out. That's because it's a situation we call total internal reflection. This is what you use, this is the what you buy from Verizon. Okay, this is what happens in the cables that, that uh, send you the information that you can watch television with and things like that. So light is a wave and it changes speeds when it goes into materials that are more dense. Now this, I actually dumpster dove for this block. Uh, it's because it sort of glows in the violet and they would shoot charged particles into it and they would excite it and then they would uh, measure the light that came off and say, ah, oh, there was a charged particle and they would see uh, how fast it was going and things like that and how much energy it had. Dave, oh, actually, Dave, your shirt's good. Oh, yeah. Dave had some nice... Uh, Einstein glows. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty good. Now, we typically do... Usually my students are saying, well, you haven't done anything to humiliate yourself lately. So... Fluorescence hairspray. <laughs> it really looks really good on me. <laughs> <laughs> you should see my pillows. At home. <laughs> okay, now... Now, there is a phosphorescent material that glows in the dark. And, oh, let's turn off this. It's actually glowing a little bit now due to the fact that we just shined a violet light on it. If I shine a green light on it, it doesn't really do anything except just reflect the light. But if I put a blue light on it, oh, it's a green. If I put a blue light on it, yep, I can actually... <laughs> put a little hair on it. <laughs> okay? So you can, that's a phosphorescent material. Remember, the green didn't excite because it was lower energy. And then there's always my favorite. Uh, can you see what that is? That's a toilet seat. That's a glow-in-the-dark toilet seat. Mark spends a lot of time in the bathroom. <laughs> When you get older, <laughs> these things come in really handy, believe me. <laughs> okay. All right. We're, let's so light is up. made up. Light is made up of waves also. <laughs> that go slower when they go into a material. So let's see a little bit more about light. And for this, we can actually leave all our lights up, which is kind of fun. I'm going to turn that on right there. Let's see if we got this guy here. What we got right here is a system of two beakers. You can kind of see them when I put the camera on them. And why do you see those two beakers? Well, as the light passes in and out of there, changing in speed and kind of uh, 
that change in speed actually allows you to see those two beakers. It actually, you know, that's why you can kind of see things, right? But if I have a magic fluid, this magic fluid, and I fill those beakers, well, something interesting may happen. Because I can actually put it right inside that first one and let it pour right in. And now you still see that inner beaker, right? No problem at all. But let me go ahead and overflow this fluid. And what happens to that inner beaker? You no longer see it. It's no longer being bent. That light no longer bends. This has the exact same speed of light as what we have in that glass. By matching those two things, we actually no longer bend the light going in and out of the beaker. So you no longer see the beaker. There you go. OK, one of the reasons you see things. There you is. One of the children that came to this once told me a nice way to do this would be to put a test tube inside of the beaker, fill it with the fluid so you couldn't see it, and take another test tube and break it on the table and dump it into the beaker, and then you reach in with a pair of tongs and you pull out the other test tube as if you might put it back together inside the beaker. You can try that at home, <laughs> but be careful. OK, now we're going to use your diffraction gratings, your yeah, rainbow goggles. Yeah, those glasses we gave you, please put them on. If you don't have any, let Where's us mine? know. We'll give you some more. They're our gift to you. Rutgers is actually giving you something. Oh, yeah, I need one. <laughs> Think about that. Uh, Doesn't uh, happen a lot. Besides a ticket. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK, now if you, th these are things that separate light into its colors. And you can see up on the screen here, I want to emphasize that the separating of light into colors isn't really just a trick. Don't turn it off yet. Yep. Um, I'm going to do one. I'm going to just say a couple words about where's you my get. laser. OK, this is mine, yeah. OK, <laughs> uh, if you look up in the sky, you, yeah, I yeah, know. Uh, you see in the sky, you'll see it right over here. Oh, oh, that's because I have my diffraction graded glasses on. Uh, <laughs> if you look over there in the sky in the evening in the winter, uh, you'll see a red star, and that's Betelgeuse. And it's red because it's cold, only 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And then you'll see some hot white stars around it, the belts of Orion and the other the feet of Orion. They're very hot stars. So a star that's cold is reddish, and a one that is hot is whitish bluish. And if you put your diffraction grating goggles up to the back of a telescope, you would see these stars would give you lots of blue and uh, not so much red, but beta juice would give you lots of red and not much, not much of the blue. Well, here I have a source, and this is a hot source. It's right here. Can you see the rainbow when you look at it? OK, it's got Roy G. Biv. Richard of York gave battle in vain. Red to, red to violet. Now, that's high temperature. Now, if Dave turns down the temperature, you'll see it disappears from the blue first. See, the blue's almost gone. And you've just got red in there now, red and green. So that means it's low temperature. And if you turn it down even further, it would then move completely into the red, and then it would move into the infrared, and you'd have to use that infrared camera we showed you earlier in order to be able to see it. So the color of something, and if you separate it into its spectrum, we call, by looking through these goggles, uh, will tell you its temperature. Now, there's some other types of spectra. Oh, you want to show those to Oh, no, that's all right. We okay. can do it. I'll bring it back later. Uh, this is a very special light. Look at this light. What do you see that's different on this one? Lines, that's right. You see lines. In particular, there's some extra lines in there because of reflections, but you see that one prominent red line? That is the most famous spectroscopic li line in the universe. It's the Balmer line of hydrogen. 80% of the universe is made out of hydrogen. So everywhere in the universe where you heat up gas of hydrogen, you get that red line along with some other ones. And now the second one, you see this one? What's the most prominent line in there? Yellow, yes. I want you to remember that yellow line. We'll come back to it later. That's from helium. 
the other 20% of the universe. The whole rest of the universe is less than the percent after that. Ah, now this one you should have seen every day. This is mercury. This is what you get when you tickle a gas containing mercury. And if we turn on a compact fluorescent bulb right above it, you see a series of compact fluorescent bulbs. You can see it basically reproduces the spectrum of mercury. Maybe a little bit else is going on, but it has mercury on the inside of that compact fluorescence bulb. That's why you have to be careful when you recycle it or when you throw it away. And now this one, this is, this is the honky-tonk special. This is uh, neon. Okay, so every element of the periodic table, when you turn it into a gas and heat it up, will have an, a line, bright line fingerprint unique to itself. Now, now remember, it's the holiday time. We just gave you these diffraction grading glasses. I'm going to turn this source on right here. What do you see happening? Oops, let's actually turn that all the way up. With all these oops, different colors, you see all those different colors. What happens in those glasses with all those colors? You actually see how those glasses work because they spread out each color a little differently. As I said, it's the holiday time. You must have some holiday lights set up in your house. You see them around in different yards. Use those glasses. Actually, look at those lights. It's a lot of fun. It really is. But never look at the sun. Look at a full never, moon. A full ever. moon is actually gorgeous with those glasses. You get a continuous spectrum. That's actually really kind of special. So you can do a whole lot of things with those glasses. You can see all kinds of stuff. And let me show you just how special those glasses are. I'm turn that one on right there. And that allows you to see something happening as this changes colors, OK? So I'm going to switch it on so that it actually goes ahead and goes through a spectrum. What do you see happening there now? Color mixing in action. Yeah, you'll see what those colors, specific colors, are made from. So that's a lot of fun. And these are just IKEA under counter lights. Nothing that special about them. But it is a lot of fun to see exactly what light is made from. And you now have those scientific tools they use all the time in science, the fraction grading. There you go. Thank you. Okay. HDMI 2. Give me the laser. Okay. I get the laser. No, I don't. Thank you. Okay. Now. We're doing okay. Uh, remember that red line from hydrogen? The bomber line, I called it? If you look at the sword of Orion and you look in the middle through a telescope, you see it's a red gaseous cloud. And it glows in the red because it's a glowing hot cloud of hydrogen. Newly born stars are heating up the hydrogen cloud around them out of which they're being born. And therefore, it glows in the red characteristic of hydrogen. Now I've got one. Oh, you're going to do the infrared? Go yeah, ahead. Is that OK? Sure, of course. OK, so uh, remember, at the start of the show, right, we were showing everybody what you all look like in infrared. And you can see yourself up here right now. And look at that. You are one hot audience. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> yeah. Everybody glowing nice and bright in infrared. Your faces are about 100 degrees, right? The clothing absorbs a little heat. And you see that our lecture hall is a little bit cooler all around you because we're measuring temperature with this, OK? But what we can do, we can show oh, yes. you that infrared doesn't work exactly the same as red. It's right next to red, but it doesn't work the same. Mark right here has a shield. He's going to hold this shield up. Turn, Mark, turn. turn it around the other way. Turn it around the other way towards them. What does that shield say? Bad physics, Bad physics show, right? You can, yeah. He's got a tough time with this, I know. <laughs> that physics show, OK? I can't be on both sides at the same time. I know, Mark. Uh, so you can see through that, right? You can see Mark's face through the sign. Right, that's because visible light goes right through it. But if I put this camera on Mark, we note that we can't really see Mark through that sign with infrared light. Infrared light does not go through glass and plexiglass. But you knew that already. You go to the beach, you park your car, you go off to the water. You come back to your car five or six hours later, how hot is your car? Very hot. You don't even want to get in it, right? That's because visible light goes through that window, heats up the interior, tries to leave as infrared light. It's still light. We just think of it as heat. Stays in the car, can't get through the glass. That's why it stays in. Can't get through the glass. Now, Mark's got a whole other object. What is it? A black plastic trash bag. Can you see Mark through it? 
No. But if I put this camera on Mark right now, you note that he's actually sticking his tongue out at you. <laughs> right there. That's because infrared light goes right through black plastic, visible light does not. It's right next to red, but it doesn't work the same as visible light. Big round of applause for Mark. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> oh. Okay. Now you want to do that one first? HDMI. HDMI? Two. Oh, you HDMI got it. HDMI too. Uh, laser. I and then we'll do. We don't want that yet. We want that. Oh, there's my laser. Ah, oh, yes. Remember when I told you to remember about that yellow line? What was it for? Helium. That's right. Well. Here's the uh, illustration of the first time they ever saw that yellow line. But all the way back in 1850, they knew the elements of the periodic table were, were itemized by their specter when they heated things up, but they'd never seen that line before when they looked at a solar eclipse. And so they named it after the sun where they discovered helium in the atmosphere of the sun in a solar eclipse, they saw that yellow line and they called it helos. The helium for the Greek word for helos, the sun. Okay, so it was discovered not on the earth and then they finally found it on the earth. They get as a byproduct from coal, uh, deep, deep coal and deep uh, oil well drilling. Now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. We're gonna do another experiment right here. Uh, What's this? This is water. You guys ever take a bath? Yeah, no. so you know what water is, right? Everybody here knows what water is. The good, good, good. All right, I got another object right here. What's that? Can of regular soda, right? That's all that is. You ever hold one of those? Yeah. How about this one right here? What's that? Diet soda. You ever hold one of those? No. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> so, water, cans of soda. You can tell me if I take this regular can of soda, put it in the water, since you know both items, you can tell me whether it sinks or floats. Wait a second. I thought you knew this stuff. What's it going to do in the water? Different answers, huh? What do we got to do to find out? Let's do that experiment. So I put this regular can of soda in the water, and it actually sinks. Diet soda, sink or float? Float, well, why? Because it's diet? What kind of theory is that? <laughs> Come on. It's got the same amount of soda. It's got the same amount of bubbles. What's it going to do in the water? You'll go home and do it, right? <laughs> oh, you want no. me to do it? That's because you're curious now. You really want to know the answer. I raised that question. Your brain is going, I want to know what it's going to do. And that's exactly why human beings do science. That's why we do experiments. We want to know the answer. So what's it going to do? Both. Now science isn't about just the experiment. Science is about why. Why? Well, what do they sweeten that soda at the bottom of the water bath with? Now, eh. What do they sweeten it with? Corn syrup. And if you took all the corn syrup out of that soda, it'd be good. two inches of thick, heavy syrup coming from that soda. It makes it more dense than water. It's big and thick and heavy. What do they sweeten this soda with at the top of the water bath? Rat poison, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you were been looking, here. They were looking for rat poison when they came up with aspartame, you realize. What does that make us? The rats, yeah. Where's, and uh, they only need a little gram of that extremely powerful chemical to make it as sweet oh, yes. as all that corn syrup. But who here has ever been in a swimming pool? Me, right? Who here has ever been in our lovely ocean? Me too. Where do you feel more of a buoyant force? Ocean. ocean why? What's in the ocean? Oh. Salt and sharks and toilet paper and lots <laughs> of stuff. So if you go ahead and pour some salt into this water bath, you can actually bring that soda right to the surface. Because sinking and floating is all about relative density, right? We've now made the water more dense than the soda, just like that, OK? Sinking and floating in water. There you go. Now, Mark's got another object that is floating in our air. Two objects. <laughs> this is a helium balloon right here, right? It's that kind that you buy all the time. And helium is less dense than air, so that it floats. 
And this is going to make a little pop now. <laughs> a bigger and a little pop. <laughs> now, this one floats even better than that one. It's more buoyant. That's because this one has hydrogen in it. And when I light hydrogen, you demonstrate chemistry. It burns with the air around it. So this is going to go boom and have a big flash. We ready? Yeah. OK. You know, when I get up to do an experiment, it's one that's a little more dangerous. What were those balloons day. floating in? What were they floating in? Air. What's inside this drum? Air. What's inside you? Air. Air. The blower? Well, all around that drum, too, is air. And if I take all the air out of this drum, we may see something peculiar happen. In fact, Where's I got a blower? vacuum pump right here. I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. The blower. And now we're going to pull all the air out of this drum. Oh, it's and all the air around is going to do something to that drum because uh, there's no longer going to be anything on the inside pressing out. But we never know when it's going to actually happen. And we never actually know how violent it is. So we're just going to let it sit and spin for a while, OK? <laughs> don't worry about this at all, Not especially you guys. Don't worry at all. Yeah, you don't need to think about it at all. Video on mute, OK? <laughs> Woo! That's not it. HDMI 2. OK. Now we're going to do another demo. While we're waiting for that, just forget about it, OK? <laughs> this is the Bernoulli effect. So we have some fast moving air coming out of uh, my wife's leaf blower. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to put a ball on top of it. And when it tries to fall off, the fast moving air has low pressure. The slow moving air has high pressure. So it always gets pushed back in. This is a little loud. Okay, now we can do this. <laughs> that one worked, okay. <laughs> we use a lot of toilet paper in the physics department. They all wondered why. They thought they knew, but now you know the real reason. <laughs> okay, just forget about that. Uh, <laughs> OK, we're moving on from pressure. Now I can start, oh, I can start explaining something about temperature and gases. And this, actually, you should pay close attention to. And ignore that thing that's going to go boom in a second. <laughs> Don't forget about it, OK? It's going to go boom sometime. OK, <laughs> here we have, what's the difference between the air molecules and this? <laughs> well, it's got to be another pair of underwear for the last part. <laughs> OK, uh, the gas pressure crushed it. Air back in, it's not going to recreate. It's actually a very heavy steel, so heavy that the atmosphere still crushes it. They've actually done this with train cars, believe it or not. OK, but think about that. OK. Now, here is, uh, this is a simulation of the gas, like the gas that was inside there, like any sort of gas. And what's the difference between these gas molecules and these? These are the side. going faster. They have lots of energy of motion. And I really want you to pay attention to this, because it emphasizes something I didn't realize until I was much older than most of you are. Fast moving air, lots of energy of motion per particle, high temperature. Slow moving particles, low energy of motion, low temperature. Temperature is just the measure of the average energy of motion of the particles that you're sticking the thermometer in. Well, if it's a gas, anyway, <laughs> it doesn't count for people. It's a little bit different. OK, so this is the basic idea. And now the pressure on this wall is quite high. That's because the molecules are bouncing off very fast off the wall. And it's like a machine gun, OK? They're bouncing off, and lots of them are hitting, so there's a constant pressure. 
Here, they're hitting here like little fluffy things. And they're bouncing off with almost no pressure. So this has low pressure. So you can see what happened with that can. We took all of the molecules out on the inside, and there were still these fast molecules pushing in on the outside, and that's why it, co it collapsed. Okay, so that's what temperature really is. Now, liquid nitrogen is a nice way to illustrate temperature because it's 77 degrees Kelvin, what, 280 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. And here I have a helium balloon. If I would let go of it, it would float up to the ceiling because it's less dense in the air. Here it has a little smile on it. Okay, and now I'm going to make it not smile so much. I am going to cool it off. And what's happening to the helium molecules in there? Helium atoms in there. They're slowing down. They're hitting the walls less hard. They exert less pressure. The balloon is collapsing because the helium inside it has slow moving molecules. They're tired, they're going to sleep. Okay, they're getting closer and closer to each other, more and more dense, and the density of the balloon goes up, and so now it doesn't float. And now they start getting excited again, they get warmed up, and they start moving around, and they start expanding, and it floats again when it re-expands, okay? So this is exactly what I told you up here. Okay, I like to do that one first because it has the real physics in it, but then there's a couple of other things you can do with liquid nitrogen that emphasize that it's cold stuff you don't really want to fool around with. Well, we've already done in one. This is a hot dog, which illustrates why you don't stick your finger in liquid nitrogen. It would turn brittle as glass. And this, what's that? And broccoli's really, I used to enjoy this a lot more until I started, until I started eating broccoli with uh, lots of garlic on it. Then it's really good. Okay, so, but now I, I still crush it. Okay, now what's this? Can you see it? No? It's yellow? And it's long? It's a banana! What's this? A banana split. <laughs> okay. Physics humor is famous for being not so good. <laughs> okay, now here's a nice, nice little flower that I'm cooling down to liquid nitrogen temperature and it changes its property and gets quite brittle. And when I take it out, it should be good now. It's brittle as glass. So you have to be really careful with liquid nitrogen. I've been keeping my distance from it here. I want you to be careful. You only work with liquid nitrogen when you know what you're doing and you keep your distance from it. Okay. Here's liquid nitrogen that's been put in a tube. And if I put a cork in the tube, it becomes our liquid nitrogen cannon. Whoa! Sorry about that. Wait a second. <laughs> Let me do one more for there. Okay, one section I missed. We have any more here? Is there a little bit? We got another one here. Any more? Think it'll still go? Yeah, there it goes. This always reminds me of my father. My father was a chemist and he worked at a nitroglycerin factory for a while. And when he got hired there, they brought him in and there were three very strong walls made of cement, and there was one wooden wall that was very weak. And he said, what's that? And they said, well, that's a blowout wall. <laughs> if you make a mistake, the explosion occurs, we come in, we build another wall, we clean up, and we hire another guy, <laughs> okay. uh, which was true. But in fact, if you're going to work in a nitroglycerin factory, you better make sure you're working in a lab that has a blowout wall, because you want the energy to go out the wall instead of staying in the room with you. Okay, what are we up to? From behind. <clears throat> ah, yes, thank you, Dad. Okay, this is the Faraday part of the Faraday lecture because now we're going to look at the interaction of charges, like uh, static electricity. When you pull off a shirt, you get charges of discharges of electricity between charged particles and magnetic fields. 
And here I have a magnetic field and a magnet, and here I have an electron gun that shoots electrons towards the front screen. It's, a, it's like an old style oscilloscope or an old style uh, TV. And I've got my hand dangling around here. I want you to notice most importantly that there's protective plastic covering here. There's high voltages inside of these things and so you don't get close to them. Okay, so here's a magnetic field and if I shoot the charged particles down the magnetic field lines, you'll see as I bring this guy in here, nothing basically happens. It wiggles a little bit maybe. But if I try and shoot the charged particles across the magnetic field lines, it bends them into curved orbits. as like this. Bam. I reverse the direction of the magnetic field and it bends it the other way. Very odd thing when it goes through a magnetic field. And if I bring it in from the side, I can make it go down or up. This is very much like our own atmosphere. Our, the Earth has a magnetic field. The charged particles coming in from the sun hit our magnetic field, and it's like an umbrella. They steers the charged particles away, so we don't have as much cancer at the surface of the Earth. Mars isn't so lucky. We have not so many charged particles here at the surface of the Earth. Now we're ready for this guy? Yeah. <clears throat> Can you go from that to this side? Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Dave's Dave's busy coaching me not to stand in front of it. Okay, this is a galvanometer, so it measures electricity going through one way or the other. And basically what I want you to understand is that here's a circle, and if I just put a magnet in there and go away and look at that magnet, nothing is happening. So magnetic fields and electricity doesn't really do anything, but if I change the magnetic field around this copper wire, electricity will in the copper wire, electricity will flow in a circle. So if I pull it out, uh, let's do it over here. <coughs> See the galvanometer? It goes from one side to the other. I change the, it's a changing magnetic field that makes electricity flow in a circle. And if I was to put a paddle wheel in here and run it with water, the electricity goes back and forth. And if I do it 60 cycles a second, I could hook it up to the wall and light a light bulb with it, okay? Just like the regular electricity you have in the wall. Okay, Dave's going to do another one. Light bulb, uh, yeah, we run electricity back and forth inside something, and that gives us light, changing electrical energy to light energy. We do that with a lot of things. But what's this right here? A pickle. A pickle. And I'm going to take that pickle and put it right over here on those two tines, because now I'm going to run electricity through that pickle. And what's really kind of interesting in running electricity through a pickle, well, it's a light bulb, like almost anything else is a light bulb, right there. You actually get light from a pickle, Pretty consistent. There you go. Just like you do any other light bulb. Right there, that's now a pickle light. And I know it stinks and I know it's gonna burn out pretty soon, but then you <laughs> still have a great snack food, so what's wrong with that, right? And I know, hey, it's a little sodium color because we're actually exciting the brine in there. That's why it's that nice sodium color. Uh, and I don't think I really recommend plugging vegetables into the wall, don't go home and do that. <laughs> but this shows you just what a light bulb is really all about, just converting that energy, thank you. Yeah, you guys are stand back. Okay, now, this is a little bit like what happens in the back of an old tile style television or oscilloscope. It has a transformer and has two capacitors that store lots and lots and lots of electrical charge on them. A dangerous amount, a really dangerous amount. And I want you to notice that I turn the apparatus off. I've put a lot of charge on these, I turn it off. And then I go down here and I also unplug it just to be safe. But I look at this thing here, it tells me the voltage is still there. All that charge is waiting to run back together and it's going to do with a loud flash and a big bang. So get ready. Let me see if I get ready to do this in the dark. Okay, you guys ready? Okay. Yes. That's why, as a matter of fact, I don't even have to, oh, it, it, it let go. <laughs> you always make sure you get the full discharge on the thing. You touch it a few times. That's why you don't go messing around the back of an old style television or oscilloscope. A large flash and a large bang the, as the charge rushes together. Lots of energy is stored. Okay, which one? You, I'll start over here? Start over there. Okay. Far Michael Faraday said, remember, changing magnetic field makes electricity flow in a circle. 
So if I have a magnet and I roll a conductor through it with lots of electrons that are free to move around, when it hits the magnet, electricity will flow and this guy will slow down. Its energy of motion will be converted into electrical energy. It's like hitting butter. Okay. If I take another version of this and I've cut a lot of the middle out, but I've left the contiguous path for electricity to flow in a circle, you see the same effect. It still shows the same slowing down because of electrical current generated. If I take one of these guys now it, that I have chopped from one side and then from the other and then from this side, chopped it so nothing can flow in a circle inside it. No more electricity flowing in a circle and he goes through as if the magnet isn't there. Now, which one? This one. Uh, you want to no, do this one? That oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Uh, if the electricity flows more easily inside the material, the effect gets bigger. More electricity flows. And so this one shows the effect on steroids or the maximum effect. He's cooled to liquid nitrogen temperature. The electrons flow really easily in that material. By the way, don't touch any of these things that are cooled to liquid nitrogen temperature. They're very, very cold. All right, so what I have here is a big tube of copper. And what we did there is we put those objects, those metals, through in a magnetic field. But here's a very strong, small magnet. And here's that big tube of copper. Now, is copper magnetic? No, and if I put this magnet up against the copper, it just falls like that. But if I take this strong magnet and now drop it through this tube instead, you'll note a very curious effect. Because you'll see down that tube that that magnet just slowly floats down that tube. There's an interaction between that magnetic field and the copper, causing a mag another magnetic field inside the copper, which actually opposes the motion of the magnet. You want to see it again? Yeah. Of course you do. <laughs> Who doesn't like watching this float down there? Just like that. And that's actually that interplay of that magnetic field of that strong magnet with all that copper giving us another magnetic field in the copper. Remember that. That's why it slows it down. It's pushing back in that way, OK? And Mark's got another couple right here. OK. Now, this is a uh, ring flinger. And there's alternating current goes through here. So that 60 times a second, the electricity reverses direction. So if I put this on here, it will see a changing magnetic field. Changing magnetic field, another satisfied customer, huh? <laughs> Dissatisfied. Uh, and so uh, the, it will induce electrical currents in here, and this will turn into a magnet. And if those two magnets attracted each other, I wouldn't be doing this demonstration. Oh, is it turned on? OK, it always helps when you plug it in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's called a ring flinger. Of course, I used to do this. I would ask a child to come up. I'd say, here, put this on for me like this. And then I'd turn it on. The poor child would come up and go. And then I turn it off and I take it away and say, no, put it on like this. Okay. <laughs> They've advised me to stop doing that. <laughs> tape off the wire. Okay. So this one has a break in it, so electricity can't flow in a circle, so it doesn't turn into a magnet and it doesn't jump up. And so I, th at this point, the child wouldn't trust me at all. So I have to put this one on, show it doesn't jump, and this one on to show that it does jump. The one with a break in it can't have electricity flow in a circle. Now the next thing is... Yeah, well here we have another type of ring and I'm going to do that one. I'm going to let that high... It goes a little higher, you notice. The shape of that atom is actually rather important with the interplay of that magnetic field from here to there. But if we actually cool this one down too, we'll see just how high it now goes. A lot higher. <laughs> so it shows you cooling it down, more efficient current, just like he showed in that other one. And then the final step, wait, the final step is that I light a light bulb with it. I was claiming that something's going around in a circle, and I claim it's electrical current, and the only real way to show that something's an electrical current is to light a light bulb with it. No connections between these guys, just the coupling through the magnetic field. OK. OK, where are we up to? All right, well done, Mark. You got this one right oh, here. Oh, yeah, this one right here. This one is cute for another reason, too. This is the same effect, 
and you roll something down a copper plate, and it's a magnet, and it will induce currents as it goes down, and the energy of motion will get converted into drag and currents going in the copper. <laughs> You'll notice, but there's two things that, there's another thing I want you to notice about that. What's that? It doesn't fall off. Okay? If I put it on so it heads towards the edge, it steers itself back to the center. Have you ever paddled a canoe? You paddle on the, in the water and it goes that way? Well, the changing magnetic field out here in the air can't induce any electrical currents. There's no drag. The changing of magnetic field over here induces currents and it's like a drag. It always self-corrects back to the more material. Okay. Mark's had a very long show. That's three days, three shows. A round of applause for Mark. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he's, he's probably really tired. So we're going to let him lie down for a little bit, OK? But I need two people to help me with our last demonstration. Nobody ever wants to help. I, I hate that. No one ever wants can, to help. My, oh, boy. You my granddaughter in the, yeah, um, in the silver. What's that? You want to do it, Molly? Like no. You don't have to. You That's right okay. There. You don't have to. We'll do it afterwards. And you right there. Thank you. Yes. Come on down. What's your name, sir? Joshua. So good to meet you, Joshua. I'm Dave. Come on down here, my young lady. What's your name? Shriya. Hey, thank you so much for volunteering. I'm Dave. Good to meet you. You know what you volunteered for? The bed of nails. <laughs> you never volunteer in a physics show. That's a really bad idea. Look at me, I volunteered years Come back over here, ago. all right? You come back over here, because here's what's going to happen. We're going to put that bed of nails right down here on that floor. Then Mark, who needs a rest, is going to lie down right there. I thought it was them was going to lie. Oh, no, oh, you I'll, I'll yeah, You, right. you, right there. And then what we're going to do, we're going to take another bed of nails and put a bed of nails, nails down on Mark. Ugh, every don't bed be in a hurry here. Ours just <laughs> I'm happens not ready to yet. be more nails. <laughs> and then what we're going to do is allow these two young people uh, to stand on Mark. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. let's see what we got. Right on over here. Just listen to us. Okay, I want you to come around this okay. side. Come around this side. Uh, uh, here's what you're going to do. I'm going to uh, lift you on up and put you right on Mark. Right like that. <laughs> Don't jump. I'm going to lift you up. Yeah, no Put dancing. you right on Mark. <laughs> and now we got two human <laughs> beings standing on Mark while he lays between two beds and nails. <laughs> And a round of applause for Mark. There we go. Mark, you okay? Oh, I'm great. Yeah, yeah he's I'm fine. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank okay. you for our two Be volunteers, careful. too. Thank you both so much. Right back on up. There you go. Now, Mark, you stay right here. We got okay. some more to talk about. Hey, we don't do this kind of thing as some kind of fantastic magic trick. We don't want you to think about this as magic. We want to explain the physics behind Mark surviving, because it is kind of Crazy. Uh, this is something that's very similar to Mark. Thin skin filled with hot air. <laughs> and what we have here is a whole lot of nails. Now think about it this way. Mark got up this morning and he, he weighed himself. He does that every morning. And it, when he weighed himself, it weighed 200 pounds. He's got it set a little low. Um, <laughs> so he saw that. So if we took a bed of nails with one nail and he laid on that bed of nails, how many pounds of force on that one nail? 200. That would go right through his body and kill him. Let's say we had 10 nails. Oh. How many pounds of force on each nail? 20. More than enough to go right through his body and kill him. Ah. Let's say we had 100 nails. How many pounds of force on each nail? Two. That actually doesn't even go through your skin. You need 12 pounds of force on a nail to go through human skin. Hey, I'm a scientist. I did the experiment. It's a bad day. <laughs> But I did Went do through the a several professors. Now, here's a whole lot of nails. Well, Mark bust on those nails. What do we do to find out? <laughs> Try it. If I just rub it across here, no. There's not enough force in any one of those very sharp nails to go through the skin of the balloon. Here we actually took out half the nails, doubling the force. Will it now bust this balloon? <laughs> the only thing you can't say is maybe. You can't put maybe on test. And no, there's not enough force in any one nail to go through there. Here we took out half again, doubling the force one more time. Does it go through the skin of the balloon? It's also our last one. <laughs> what will happen? That's how we do multiple choice tests too, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> there it goes. But you're all beginners. Who's ready to start with one? 
I'm joking. Don't do that. Don't do that. But Mark, you know, when I was a student, Mark was one of my professors, oh, yeah? and he gave me a very lousy grade. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, I have something to do with Mark right here. We got that sign again. What's that sign say? Bad physics show. If you like what we do here, come and see us in the city. But it looks just like a guillotine, right? We're going to put it right over Mark's neck, like that. Now what we got is a big cinder. Get down there. A big cinder block. And we're going to take the cinder block. We're going to put it on Mark's rock hard ass right here. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and now what we're going to do is I got a sledgehammer. What? Because, well, yeah. <laughs> and it's too late to change the grade again. Are you sure? Yeah, <laughs> I tried. So here's our experiment. Bed and nails, Mark, brick, oh, sledgehammer. Okay, okay. Does Mark lift? <laughs> what do we do to find out? <laughs> Try it. Uh, All right, three, two, one. <laughs> Break the brick, and Mark still oh, is alive. Yeah. He just gets up a little slower every year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we'll uh, stop the feed for a little bit and stop any cameras running. I have one last demonstration that I do. the 20th anniversary of a Saturday show. Let's hear it for our students. Yes. Yeah. Let's hear it for Mark right here, all right? And let's hear it for all of you in the audience. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Hey, it's the 20th anniversary, so we even have the cake. There you go. Thank you. All right? Thank you, for coming. Thank you both so much. show you a little bit about how physics works, and also uh, it, you know, hopefully stimulate your curiosity uh, about the world around you. Now, as I mentioned, the Mark has been doing this for, and David also, for, for 20 years. And if we at the Defense Department are very proud, and we want to make sure that he has the ability to continue to do this for 20 more years. So we have a little, we have a little token that will hopefully help you in that endeavor. Can you say something? Oh, thank you. <laughs>